Okay, so this um, this verse is from, I mean, we all know this verse, Proverbs 16 and verse 3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit your, work, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. A very familiar verse and, uh, and a very uh, awesome promise that when we commit our works to him, our very thoughts will be established. And um, whatever is in the thought realm, Oh, our imaginations, I just like to you know, extend it to all that our imaginations will be established. Our uh, whatever we, uh, our emotions, right, which which stem from our thoughts, right, um, will be established um, and so on. So, um, so when we commit our works to Him, like yesterday we looked at Romans 6, right, how we are called to you know, present our members to Christ in the same way when we commit our works to him then everything from the thought level whatever stems from that right, imaginations emotions everything will be established and that's a promise from the word of God so uh, we'll do well to commit our works to God right and, and in committing our works to God um, uh, everything kind of uh, you know, is purified, refined, and uh, uh, and every every um, maybe even our attitude towards something, or uh, 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 you know, more than attitude, even if we had something hidden or something hidden, the thoughts of our heart are exposed, right? So in that, there is clarity. And also there is refining and this purifying. So, um, so let's just pray this morning and say, Lord, we commit our works to you. Uh, whatever we are expected to do, uh, uh, whatever our work responsibility requires, um, whatever tasks that need to be done, Lord, we commit it to you. You know, maybe as students, we're saying, okay, God, I need to, I need to complete this. I need to study this. I need to finish these assignments. And uh, uh, and really, you know, our responsibility is to is to study. You know, go back and maybe look into whatever was um, you know, taught in class. And maybe there's a backlog, etc. You know, just commit that area to to the Lord. And uh, the promises that our thoughts will be established. And I would say the thoughts, imaginations, emotions, everything will be established. Right. So let's let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you this morning that for this promise that when we commit, Lord, when we uh, roll it off our back, God, whatever works that we need to do, God, when we place it at your feet, God, um, Lord, our thoughts will be established, made firm, made clear, and Lord, resulting in a great action, God. And so, God, we thank you, Lord, that you, when you, when our thoughts are established, even our Lord, what our mind ponders about, God, what our mind meditates on, Lord, and uh, as a result of that, the emotions that arise, God, everything is established by you, Father God. We thank you, and uh, and Lord, we pray that each of us, Father God, we may experience that establishing of thoughts and imaginations and, and uh, emotions even right now, Lord, as we commit, Lord, uh, ourselves to you as we present ourselves to you god as uh, our members everything within us god as we present ourselves to you and lord as we commit our works to you god maybe establish maybe experience the establishing work of your holy spirit lord establishing our, our thoughts establishing our actions god maybe maybe experience that even right now father god we thank you we bless your name we give you all the praise and glory in jesus matchless name we pray Amen. Amen. Okay. Hey, those of you who joined in, um, yeah, good morning. Welcome. Um, we're going to continue from where we um, paused yesterday, uh, which is uh, we're looking at the res restoration of our soul, and we looked at uh, how we've been given authority to cast out demons, right? to, to, to cast them off from whatever they are oppressing us with. It could be oppressive thoughts. It could be maybe we have given them permission, right? Uh, we've given them an invitation to step in and oppress and uh, and maybe create fear and all that. And and we have been given the authority to expel. We've been given the authority to 
cast them out. So, so what we need to do is, uh, you know, receive that authority, receive that truth, embrace that truth, uh, and say yes. Um, maybe we've been, in a, you know, we've been a believer for many years, or we've been new believers. Now, it does not matter. Maybe you have been, um, you know, a compromising believer or a victorious one. Again, you know, put aside that compromise and say, God, you know, I receive this. I thank you for the authority that you've given me to to resist the work of the enemy and to come against the work of the enemy and to give no permission for the work of the enemy in my life and others who are connected to my life, right? Then the next one that we uh, we are seeing, we can see, we see is, um, we just share the notes. Um, the next thing that we see is about um, about the work of the Holy Spirit or the anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? Now we know uh, what anointing means. Anointing is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, every yoke or any every bondage is broken. And when you say bondage, it's just imagine a knot. Just imagine you know tying something in a in a knot uh, or something like a chain or a leash, which is restraining. You know, uh, maybe if you have a pet, you know you take the pet on a leash on a walk and uh, you know the dog wants to go left or go there run over there but the leash actually is restraining leash right now here the restraining leash is is not a good one it is restraining us from actually preventing uh, uh, us from going into the things that God wants us to go into, you know, doing those things that God wants us to do, experiencing uh, those things that God wants us to experience. So that's a very restraining, constraining leash, right? So um, here we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which breaks that leash or breaks that entangled, um, the, the restraining um, Thing which we call as a bondage. So when we look at Isaiah 10 and verse 27, um, so this is what we see, Isaiah 10, 27. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now we know the oil is the type of the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Um, and so here he's actually talking about the return of the you know, a, a remnant of Israel. And, um, and and the Lord is talking about the Assyrian and, uh, uh, and the Egyptians and, and so on. And then he's talking about the Midianites. And um, so, so here he's just talking about the liberty or the freedom uh, here for the people of Israel. And uh, the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil, right? So the anointing refers to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, the uh, um, so the anointing, the oil refers to the uh, the, it's the type of the Holy Spirit, and uh, the anointing is the anointing oil, the work and uh, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and Isaiah sixty-one. You know, if you go, if you turn over to Isaiah sixty-one, and uh, you can follow through in the notes as well says the spirit of the lord is upon me and we know this is a prophetic uh, uh, you know passage which the lord reads out and uh, and then he says you know today this is uh, fulfilled in your hearing right and uh, we see that in the gospel so um here uh, isaiah 61 the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Right. So you see those things that that are listed there. Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me, and then talks about all the various things that He was anointed to do, anointed to carry out, to preach good tidings to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound, right? uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. Now it talks about you know some exchange to uh, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, and that He may be glorified. And then it goes on to talk about how, what they will do. You know, they shall be named the priests of the Lord, and they will rebuild this and so on, right? The anointing of the Lord. Right? So the anointing of the Lord uh, uh, empowering a person to do these things. But you see, the outcome of it is to the outcome of the anointing is to comfort, right? is to heal the brokenhearted, uh, is to bring liberty. Uh, the opening of prison to those who are bound. Right? So the anointing of the Lord does that. So we're looking at restoration of the soul so when it comes to bondage, uh, when it comes to um, you know the, when it comes to mourning, when it comes to uh, when it comes to all these things, the work of the Holy Spirit is, is there to restore the soul of the person, a soul that is weary. A soul that is in mourning, a soul that is, uh, uh, in a way, comfortless, right? Without hope, maybe. So that's the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, which goes beyond uh, even our human reasoning, right? Which goes beyond our human reasoning, the work of God. And um, and no wonder, you know, the Word of God very clearly says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And, and the Holy Spirit is called, he is called the Comforter. Um, the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, he, with his presence and power and his uh, ministry, there is a, there's, a, there's a freedom and a liberty that we experience. And uh, we've all experienced it. You know, it could happen in a corporate setting when there's maybe uh, a time of worship that's happening. And then, the, you know, we experience the presence of the Lord. And, and uh, for some strange reason, you know, whatever heaviness that we walked in with is, it just dissipates, right? Whatever mountains that seem to be before us are just not there. And we experience uh, a joy in our spirit, okay? Um, and it happens, uh, and we, we're not able to give any reason for that joy, uh, because we know in the back of our mind that problem is still there. And, uh, it's not solved yet, but, the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, to change us on the inside, to change our emotions, um, to to lead us into freedom, you know, in the emotional realm, in the realm of our soul, right? To give hope um, and the assurance of His presence, right? and it in a supernatural way. Sometimes we might be completely down in our in our spirit, just down, and and uh, and. We just may be praying, or maybe not even able to pray, but we're just inviting the work of Holy Spirit, and we're saying, "God, nothing comes out. No word come, words come out, but yeah, all we're able to say is, Lord, uh, we need you, Lord,' and that's that's all. That's it. And and the work of the Spirit of God, you know, which brings in so much of joy and peace. Right? There's restoration, and uh, and and that is what. The anointing of the Holy Spirit does for us personally, so we can, you know, what is the basis for our healing and restoration, and uh, basis for the restoration of our soul? Well, it is the anointing, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So we know this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so we can base our, you know, our uh, our, our expectation for healing and restoration. We can base it on the power and uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, the next thing that we see is that um, the Word of God, the engrafted Word, okay, uh, the implanted Word, um, which is again quickened to our hearts um, uh, and by the Holy Spirit. It becomes part of us, it uh, cleanses, heals, brings about uh, restoration. Right? Uh, James chapter 1 verse 21, therefore lay aside um, all filthiness and, uh, just give me a minute please, yeah, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness 
and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls just um so this is the thing laying aside is part of it because that's kind of hindering um uh, laying aside all uh, filthiness okay and all the overflow of wickedness and that requires us to do something you know that requires our choice we need to lay aside and so um the that's the first thing lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness and the second one is to receive okay to receive with meekness the word of god the engrafted or the implanted word of god okay so um so what does it mean which is um, you know which is the the implanted or engrafted one is is something that the word of god which means that it has this whole idea of bringing into our being okay the word of god being brought into our being uh, uh, and uh, that is what is brought in to our being it is not there it brought in and uh, we know that is also the work of the holy spirit it quickens the word to us right and so uh, uh, so there is a deposit of the word and that word it says here which is able to save your souls which is able to save your souls and the word there is sozo uh, the word for greek for save is sozo which means to save uh, it means to keep a person take a person out of danger to save to deliver to protect to heal to preserve and so on right so this word of god this engrafted or quickened by the holy spirit word of god this timely rhema word of god is able to save our soul right and the word their soul meaning suke and uh, whatever uh, that is uh, there uh, with the soul realm right which is able to save our souls so uh, Uh, there is there is a safety there is a healing there is a um, you know the, we are being made whole in this area through the word of god right and uh, the word of god is so precious uh, we are actually made whole through the quickened word of god so the word of god is uh, i mean we we you know hebrews 4 talks about the word of god being living and the word of god um sorry uh, the word of god um being uh, sharper than any two edged sword the word of god being able to differentiate between you know the thoughts of the you know, the intents of the heart the thoughts and so on so the word of god bringing life bringing life to us and it is changing us changing us and the psychological part of us changing our soul right um john uh, look at john 15 Right, John 15, and uh, let's look at uh, those verses um, where the Lord says, "I'm the true vine," and I don't know. So where He says that uh, we need to abide in Him, and uh, His words need to abide in us. Okay, so abide meaning staying, dwelling. Uh, so He's saying, if you abide in Me, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Now. unlike uh, a natural plant which is uh, the vine is the branch is connected unless it's you know cut away physically but we uh, we we have the tendency to move away you know, we we have the tendency to we have the choice to to really stay connected or disconnected right so it's not automatic so which is why it says um, the lord says you know you if you abide in me Okay, so which is a choice that you make to stay connected to the vine, and my words abide in you. Okay, and then the Lord says, "You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you." So you stay, you abide. Now there's going to be, you know, you're going to know the will of God. You're going to know the desires of God, and uh, you're not going to be asking amiss. And then my words abide in you, so that's going to produce faith, and uh, you know that's also going to clar clarify and and renew our uh, our, our, our love for Him and purify, refine our 
desires again, and we will not ask them as, but we will ask in faith. Uh, so he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Right? So the engrafted word uh, affects us uh, or changes us on the inside or transforms us. So we receive the word of God. Right? But there needs to be a clearing away of all wickedness and filthiness and overflow of wickedness, as the word says. And we receive with humility, and receiving with meekness, um, the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Okay, so, so based on this, based on the word of God, based on the ministry of uh, the Holy Spirit to bring the engrafted word, um, to make sure that the word is engrafted in us, right? So based on that, you know, that's the basis again for our healing and uh, uh, restoration, for the restoration of the soul, for healing and deliverance. Right? So, um, so this is again the basis for which we can say, yes, there can be a perfect restoration of the soul. Right? The Word of God is able to bring that change. The Word of God is able to make that change in, in, the, in the soul of a person. Right? Um, the entrance of the Word brings light. The entrance of the word brings light. So there is illumination because of the word of God. The word of God is God is light and his word brings illumination. Um, and uh, and John chapter 1 is, uh, you know, again, talking about the eternal word, the living word, the person of the Lord Jesus. It says, um, it says that uh, uh, in the beginning was the word and then goes on to say that was the true light verse 9, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So it's talking about the, the word being the true light, and so also the quickened word, which brings light. The entrance of his word, um, of the engrafted word, brings light. So where there is the need for darkness to be dispelled, uh, there is need for uh, the word of God to bring in conviction, to bring in strength, the word of God does that. Right, and uh, and that's the thing, you know. That's the beauty of it. That 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 is enough. Right, the word of God brings about that change, which nothing else can uh, bring about. Right? The ministry of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, brings about change where no one else, nothing else, can actually bring about. Of course, there's always, or oh, there could be a human agent as an instrument, but the work of the Spirit. I just want to share, you know, like uh, um, like two years ago, uh, my father went went on to be with the Lord. So um, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of change, right? Especially for my uh, mother, and um, uh, she was, of course, uh, inconsolable, you know, kind of missing in every day uh, because he was unwell for the last. I mean, for the for some five years before he passed away. So. Everything revolved for her, revolved around him, you know, taking care, uh, etc. So suddenly there was a big vacuum. Uh, even though there was this assurance of, uh, you know, where he was, uh, there was this pain, constant pain for her, especially because, you know, that's what she was um, fully occupied with. So, uh, so of course, you know, all of us, family, you know, we were there, and then. Of course, we had to come back, and then daily phone calls, and 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 in all the conversation, there is this whole thing of uh, again reassuring sure. about heaven, reassuring about uh, you know, where he was, and and all that. But still, there was that internally, you know, for her, uh, it was not something was uh, I don't know. She wasn't uh, at that place of strength and consolation. Till a time when, uh, in a dream, God really spoke to her, showed her some things, explained, and uh, which was the work of the Holy Spirit. And and from then on, you know, there was a there was a marked change. Right? There was a strength, there was a consolation, and there was a great change um, from that from that time onwards. So what I'm saying is that uh, you know the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God brings about change, and no wonder the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. Okay, 
uh, he's called the comforter he's called the helper and uh, he brings about help and comfort uh, in a way uh, because he is the god of hope and comfort he brings about in a way no human words or reasoning can right and all in the soul realm you know it's so true uh, the anointing of the holy spirit to turn us away from a season of mourning you know, into um, a, a different season altogether so uh, to take away the garments or uh, clothes and garments of praise and to take away the garments of heaviness the spirit of heaviness right so uh, the holy spirit does that and uh, and praise god for his work so we can confidently base our faith our expectation our confidence in the work of the holy spirit you know uh, in as long as that person is able to receive or wants to receive that's that's important of course right so so we see that uh, the holy spirit able to god is able to bring that to pass right okay so let's uh, let's look at some things um uh, that we uh, as uh, as people as recipients of his of the work of god recipients of the work of uh, you know uh, uh, the anointing and the word of God, uh, recipients of the finished work of the cross. Uh, there are some things that we need to do. Okay, there are some things that uh, decisions that we need to make. Okay, let's look at some of them. Okay. So one thing is to cancel all ties and close all entry points. So, so what does that mean? Right. Um, so that. We, we looked at the fact that okay there could be you know we either because of our ignorance because of our own action or inaction right we could have inadvertently opened up ourselves to the influence of the enemy right to the influence of the enemy to the oppression of the enemy and uh, uh and the enemy comes with one agenda to steal kill and destroy to take away our peace, to steal away our peace, to kill whatever, you know, dreams we might have, right? Um, figuratively speaking, but then also in the natural, he comes to steal, kill and destroy, right? To completely, uh, you know, uh, even before our time to take us off our purpose, right? So, um, so that's the agenda of the enemy. So if we have opened up our lives, right, because of our action, inaction, uh, knowingly and knowingly, then uh, we must make a choice. We must make a choice to um, to close, you know, to identify, to recognize, and to close, to acknowledge. Okay, yeah, this is what I did, and you know, I just wanted to, I want to close that. Right. So Ephesians four actually um, talks about how we need, we should not give a foothold for the enemy, right? And it's in, the, it's in. Um, in the context of uh, wrath, which is uh, you know anger, uh, it's in the context of uh, relationship. Um, so it, it says here, you know, Ephesians four twenty five. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Right. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil right? it goes on to give other instructions so the thing is do not give a place a foothold uh, an open door to the devil to the enemy right um now the lord has provided his provision on the cross his finished work on the cross the work of his holy spirit and the ministry of his holy spirit and the, and the word that he's made available for us all that is you know this this provision is is provided for us now it requires our choice our decision to do certain things right and uh, and so now we cannot blame god right sometimes we do that we sometimes turn around and blame God, but the fact is that God is for us. He is on our side, right? And it, certain things, uh, you know, the way He is, He is, uh, He has created us. 
uh, we need to make that choice. We need to make that decision. And actually, Satan tries to keep us you know, very subdued from even making that choice. Right? Our will is so weakened that we are, you know, we're not willing to make that choice, make that decision, to stand up and make that choice. Our will is so battered over and over at times. Right? We're not able to make that decision. So. Um, this decision to close all ties of the enemy, to severe all, cancel all ties of the enemy, and to close all the entry points is something that we need to make. And the example is that, yes, we are God's property, and he has granted the stewardship of our spirit, soul, and body, You know, which means that, okay, he's given us, okay, you worship out of your own free will. You make the choice. You make the choice to, you know, to abide. You make the choice to reject. God has given us that choice. So he's not going to you know, force himself on us or he's not going to uh, you know, completely cut away our will so that we do things automatically without, you know, uh, whether we like it or not. No, he has given us that thing. So we are his property. And, um, and the perfect example is that of a landlord and a tenant. Right, so uh, the yes, we belong to the landlord, but the, but the tenant, you know, has the right to use, or the landlord has actually given the permission, given that space, uh, given that property, and said, you know, this is now yours. Okay, now you take care of it. Now you live in it. Now what we allow into that, into our house, uh, is is not the landlord's problem, but actually the tenants, um, you know, tenant tenants problem in the sense uh, we need to be careful the landlord uh, the landlord owns the property but then we are the ones who are living so we need to steward it well right so we need to if we are giving permission for somebody to walk in to that door if we keep that door open and I uh, you know I, I remember once uh, uh, we you know in a, in a place where we stayed earlier we used to have these Huge, uh, I mean, balcony doors. Uh, so we used to normally keep it open. First floor, I think it was second floor. We used to keep it open. And one day, um, suddenly, you know, my, uh, my wife was just in, in the kitchen and she was shouting, and, and she said, "You know, Ruth, don't come down. Don't come down. Stay where you are." And it was a two levels that house. So room was up and. Stay where you are. And then uh, I just walked in and I see, you know, two monkeys. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of them is just sitting on the dining table, is opened uh, on uh, one box. And uh, some cakes were there, just taking it. And then and the other one is having some fruit in its hand. And then and then we shoot them off and then they, you know, went out. But the fact is this, we left the balcony door open. And uh, of course, we didn't, we had no clue that these would come. You know, we had. Uh, I think just started staying there, and uh, so these just came in, and actually they made some two other visits also. <laughs> uh, so uh, the other visit was really funny. My brother was actually sleeping on the couch, and he and he oh he he actually woke up. He felt somebody was looking at him. He woke up and he saw this monkey, <laughs> you know, uh, just staring at him, uh, standing close by and staring at him. So, so the the point is this, you know, they came in through that balcony door. And the door was open, right? So I cannot, uh, you know, blame the house owner for it, right? So as a tenant, it's up to me. It's up to me. I make the choice. So in a similar way, you know, we have been given, we have been provided, we have been given the authority, we've been given uh, the empowerment, we've been, you know, the finished work of the cross. You know, you look at all that as believers and. So we cannot afford to be passive. Okay, we don't have to be paranoid. Just want to say, you know, both those things. You don't have to be paranoid and say, okay, is the devil here? Is the devil there? Is he behind this door? Is he behind the curtain? We don't have to be paranoid because we've been given the authority. We've been given the, I mean, the finished work of the cross. The provision of the cross has, you know, changed us, and and the indwelling presence of God. You know, he, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. So we don't have to be paranoid. At the same time, we should not be passive in the sense, you know, very passive, not alert, not thinking, 
uh, not you know uh, having foresight, not discerning, right? So we cannot have both extremes. So in our dynamic and living and thriving relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, He's speaking to us. We are community communing with Him, and uh, you know He alerts, He prompts, He shows us in very different ways, and and of course He's given us the uh, you know our minds to use and common sense and all that wisdom, right? So we can make those decisions, right? So let's look at um, you know how are these uh, entry points um, uh, or ties and entry points? Uh, how are they uh, established? Right. We will look at that. Um, so, but the thing is for us to understand that yes, um, we can make that decision to say no to the enemy. We can make that choice, and uh, we have been given the authority. Okay, um, so we, we we're going to look at that. You know, some of uh, the ties and entry points, and and uh, uh, and in fact, all the things that we saw earlier, uh, when with regard to the problems of the uh, of the soul, um, there are uh, yeah. From you know, when it comes to generational bondages, maybe some dedication. So we're going to look at that in um, in a little bit. Um, so I will just move on to the next one which is uh, the restoration of the soul uh, receiving healing and deliverance and we're going to look at uh, you know different ways by which we receive uh, healing and deliverance and uh, and in doing so we will also look at uh, some of these ties and uh, and things that we need to sever you know in our lives right okay so healing and deliverance through sanctification and Consecration. Okay, uh, so that's the first one: to sanctification and consecration. Okay, so which means that whenever we we think of healing and deliverance, we normally have this. I mean, especially if we are in the charismatic church, um, you know, environment, and we've been there for a while, and we've also maybe seen the ministry. Uh, up close, we we know that okay. Uh, when it comes to casting of demons, there is you know the laying on hands and then uh, the commanding the evil one to leave and so on. You know that's that's what you see. But then it doesn't have to be a shouting match. It doesn't have to be that way at all, right? All it doesn't have to be like that. It can be through sanctification, which means setting ourselves apart. It can be through just consecrating our lives. So that. When we sanctify ourselves unto the Lord, when we consecrate our lives, our you know actions, everything to the Lord, then automatically there is a breaking off, there is a falling away of demonic influence in our lives. Right? There is a falling away. So what are, what are we saying when we consecrate? We are saying yes to the Lord. We are saying no to the enemy. Right? We are we are saying, oh, Lord, you you know you have access to my life and with our will, you know, we, we involves our will. We're saying, Lord, you have access. We invite you, come in, uh, and you know, take control. So there is a as when light walks in, when when I mean when there is light, there is the expelling of darkness, or darkness leaves. Right? There is a disappearing of dissipation of darkness. So, so it happens when we sanctify, when we consecrate our lives to the lord okay um and uh, and it's an ongoing thing right we do not open our lives by living unrighteous or you know uh, lives um by like walking in sin willful sin or ignorance but we consecrate ourselves right and some of the ways by which I, the enemy makes inroads Need not always be through blatant sin. In the sense, you know, we we know that okay, certain acts of sin are, you know, very very visible, and you know, it's right there. But certain things are like very very subtle, right? And some things we know. Yeah, this is uh, it is the work of the flesh. It's very plain. 
and uh, and this is a big one and it's very visible i know how it will affect me and we can stay off but certain things are very very subtle in a sense it can be an attitude right it can be something that i harbor in my heart it can be uh, it can be so subtle right it can be uh, a hardening of heart right and uh, it can be a hurt or a grudge um, that i harbor in my heart so it is very subtle right it's it's something that um, the enemy can actually have access to you know influence and give all reasons and say yeah you have every reason to be hurt you have every reason to be angry you have every reason to be offended um you are justified in doing that and all that reasoning is happening and the stronghold is being built in our minds and where we're saying yeah I i'm i can never forgive this person right i'm i can never forgive this person i can never forgive this whatever you know this family this this organization what you know it can be it can be anything right um all else i can, uh, you know all, all others i can but this one person you know i can never forgive and uh, it is so subtle right so which means that we are actually allowing the work of the flesh to take precedence over uh, over our lives right now we are being carnally minded it could be a small area but we are being carnally minded in that right so so that's the thing to continue to be tender hearted right uh, and that's why we need the continued presence of god and we need to abide with him and it's so it's an ongoing thing it's a daily ongoing thing where we go before him where we present our members unto righteousness and uh, we receive that cleansing we receive that healing and wholeness and uh, we come out of our time with him uh, stronger you know, fresher to face the world uh, and do things and we and we do that right so if it's a like a very dedicated time in his presence and, and of course during the day you're constantly communing with him and, and and this is you know not just for people in ministry because we understand that so, uh, you know like full time quote unquote ministry but it's for everyone right you're a working professional you're a, you know you're a homemaker you're a student you're it's for everybody right because people are people and people wherever we are you know we can we can easily slip into offense and um we can e- easily become hard hearted or you know have a grudge and, and so on right? in all environments where the people are involved we can you know, or we don't need people around we can people can just send a text or email and whatever or or ignore a text or an email and we get hurt right so so that's the thing so through consecration and through a walk of sanctification we are actually doing something very very powerful right we are giving inroads or we are opening up our lives for the work of the holy spirit and we are shutting away the influence of the enemy right the incessant uh, accusation of the enemy right the enemy screams guilt and shame and pours out uh, guilt shame and accusation and this is what he does you know he invites us to gives us options consider options for sinning and justifying those options and so on we cut away that voice right you know that doesn't mean that you know we will not uh, that suggestions won't be there but we actually cut away the power of those suggestions right when we when we sanctify ourselves when we consecrate ourselves unto the lord okay um okay any questions here i think we have about 5 more minutes but any questions anything that you might want to add okay everybody's okay right okay so uh, healing and deliverance again through uh, 
God's presence and anointing. We, we, we saw that. So uh, the presence of God brings about healing and it can be in a corporate setting when there's prayer, when there's ministry, when there's worship, you know. So so that's the, you know, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that we are a body of Christ and, uh, you know, the, there's, and there's someone who prays over us um, and someone who ministers or we are together worshiping God, seeking God. And you can come at a time when, you know, you, your heart is hungry and, you uh, you're hungry for God and God needs that hunger, right? And his presence, his anointing brings the difference. There's a release of, uh, uh, you know, release from all kind of heaviness and so on. And also uh, through the gifts of the spirit, right? Maybe there's a word of knowledge that is released and the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom and, um, you know, a prophecy that comes. And then suddenly, you know, there is that, uh, there is, there is that breaking away of, uh, of things that were, holding us back, right? Um, so third one is when we actively resist the work of the enemy. Okay. So James 4, 7 is very clear. Submit to God. Bring yourself under the lordship, under his lordship, under his authority. And then he gives the authority and strength so you can actually resist the enemy, right? So you see the order. Submit to God, resist the enemy, okay? Um, so, which means that we need to know what we need to, you know, how to submit to him. And we also need to discern what is the work of the enemy. Okay. And not get confused. God, God is doing his work and then we resist that instead. Right. And many times we do that, you know, we are, we are so inviting of the enemy and his work and we are resisting God and his work because, you know, that's sometimes inconvenient, right? It's a work of cleansing. It's a work of refining, and then we find it uh, inconvenient. We, we resist that instead, right? So James four seven: Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we are actively uh, resisting the work of the enemy. Okay. First Peter one and verse thirteen: Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so gird up your mind, gird up the loins of your mind. Okay, so, and of course, I think you've heard it said so many times, the picture is that of, uh, you know, um, of those times and the customs, the, the kind of um, apparel that they wore, that they would gird it up. You know, if if it moved to action, if you need to run, and you don't want to trip on the on your robe, and so gird up the loins of your mind. Similarly, you know, maybe there are things that are just not allowing you to think clearly. So you need to gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now it also talks about how. You know, this submission and resistance and everything. The core thing is relationship, intimacy with God, right? So it is not um, some things, uh, sometimes that we miss that out, right? We focus on the principle. Yes, that is important. Like even when it comes to renewing our minds and, um, you know, confessing the word and all that. These are, you know, important principles which are there and uh, yes they have uh, they, they have power they're powerful principles um, which are life transforming changing right but behind that is the relationship the foundation of the or the source of that is the relationship with the presence of with with the person rather right so if we take that off, and just focus on the principle, or just work on the principle. That it may be like a meaningless, um, and it'll be a, it'll be an exercise. But what actually fuels that principle is the person, right? So our relationship, intimacy with Jesus, is what fuels the principle. We need to understand that, right? So it's it's relationship with Him, which is first and foremost, and which really energizes the principles, like. You know, resisting the enemy, right? First and foremost thing is submitting to God. So it's our relationship with Him, and uh, so that is what will 
uh, that is what will actually take us through, right? Okay, so um, so we looked at two of these, three of these points. We there are some more that we need to go through. So we will we will look at that, right? Um, and these are things that we can actually, um, um, you know, ask God. I mean, we can actually do this for our own selves, right? Um, so we're going to look at some 14, 14 things, fourteen steps. And even as we uh, look at it in from the next class, each of these we can actually, um, you know, put it to practice in our lives, and then move on to the next one, right? So we we will, we will do that from our next class. Okay, so we'll stop here. And uh, yeah, you guys have a good weekend. God bless. Uh, we'll catch up uh, next week. Right. Thank you, Take care. Bye-bye. Right. See you. Bye-bye.